Well, thank you, everyone, and uh, thanks, Lindsay. I'm thrilled to be presenting here. Um, we at EIA know that everybody loves our materials, and it was high time one of us got to speak. But before I start, I'd just like to recognize some staff who were helpful in getting the slide deck pulled together, namely Arup Malik, Jim O'Sullivan, and Warren Wolchewski. So I'm going to speak about how energy is moved from fields and from mines to your cars and your homes. The twist will be that I'll be focusing in on the energy logistics side rather than just purely the energy um, source itself. Okay, and I think I'm doing this right. There we go. Did I go too far? Yeah, I did. Okay, it's got a little bit of a lag or what? Okay. There we go. Okay, shameless plug for EIA. So we were created in 1977. We um, are the independent statistics and analytical arm of the US Department of Energy. And the current Secretary of Energy refers to us as the Google of energy data. About 300 employees plus contractors were putting out a variety of annual, monthly, and weekly reports. We also do short-term and long-term analyses. Everything we prepare is for public consumption. But um, nothing is reviewed by either the Secretary's Office, Congress, or the White House prior to its release. Okay, energy sources and end users are not co-located. Logistics figure in prominently along every step from extraction through production through storage and blending to end consumption. This talk will primarily address the tra transportation modes, namely pipeline, water, rail, and truck, and the energy they move, coal, natural gas, petroleum, as well as biofuels. I'm going to exclude electricity. It's a very sophisticated network of um, transmission and distribution lines, which have been topics of other um, energy talks. So there are many variables that are that come into play when deciding what transportation mode you're actually going to use. And my talk will focus in on the infrastructure in place, highlighting the type of infrastructure, the type of energy moved, and the, um, the different types of locations. And I will also mention a few emergency-related effects. So the data here in the blue bars is energy um, commodity ton miles from the Department of Transportation. A ton mile is a single ton of a commodity that is transported one mile. The blue, the dark blue diamond markers, those are the, um, the relative importance of energy related to total freight moved by these various modes in 2015. What you'll see here is that pipelines are the primary source for shipping any energy commodity, it's about 1 million ton miles or about 45% of all energy commodity movements. Rail is used for the heavy solids like coal, petroleum, coke, as well as liquids where other infrastructure is unavailable or incompatible. And then you have water as well as trucks that are involved in almost, the trucks are involved in every aspect of delivery to retail installations. Okay, this image is complicated, but what I wanted to show you here was the huge variety of transportation modes that are used to get gasoline to market. Now, the important thing here is that gasoline comes from crude oil, and crude oil is produced both domestically and imported. And you can use tankers, pipelines, um, rail cars to transport both the domestic and imported crude oil to the refineries, or to ports where now we're exporting those. Um, in addition, it then refineries are producing gasoline blend stock. It's being pushed out through pipelines as well as tanker and barge to blender terminals where it's being combined with ethanol arriving by rail. And then tanker trucks are picking it up and delivering it over to gas stations for consumers. So what you see in something like this is no single mode of transport is used to get anything to its final destination. Now, energy commodities are also not consumed immediately when they're produced, and they go into storage facilities like these here until they're needed. And these include the above ground um, storage tanks on the left, the uh, underground storage facilities that you see with natural gas on the right, as well as in transit facilities that happen along pipelines and rail. 
Now, the ones on the left, petroleum and product terminals, you probably have driven by these 50,000, 100,000 barrel cylindrical tanks, or maybe you've seen a spherical or a bullet-shaped one for propane. Those are the types of storage facilities we're talking about there. And on the right, these, of course, you're probably never seeing, but um, the depleted fields that are shown with the gold triangles are the primary one and are a little less geographically limited than the other choices for natural gas storage. And oh, I should say, all these maps that I'm showing are available on our US energy mapping system that's available on the EIA website. So as we said earlier, pipelines carry the natural gas, the petroleum products, the hydrocarbon gas liquids, and crude oil. Um, from various sources, source locations to some point probably a terminal from which it will eventually get to market. What we see on our maps are major interstate as well as high volume intrastate um, pipelines. We are not showing smaller diameter intrastate or distribution pipelines. And one other thing I wanted to mention is you'll see that in these maps, our pipelines don't stop at the US border. And that is because um, we've been involved in a trilateral effort with Canada and Mexico to try to institute um, maps, as well as other activities, but maps of energy assets and border crossings and make them consistent across places and on a common website. And the one that um, is used right now is called the North American Cooperation on Energy Information. So let's look at natural gas first. In the United States, we have over 2.5 million miles of natural gas pipelines. But 300,000 of these are shown on this map, and these are just the transmission pipelines. Pipeline operators have responded to many of the shifts in demand as well as production that Kyle was talking about. And um, so you, we've seen reversals, we've seen repurposing of pipelines. There have been new build outs and expansions. With crude, you have about 76,000 miles of crude oil pipelines. And what I find interesting about this map is note how it's delimited between the Rocky and Appalachian Mountains. So what you're seeing here is um, there are certain spots where pipelines won't go, and you know that other modes of transportation are going to take the crude oil the rest of the way, be it uh, if it's there's waterways, it could be barge or tanker, or you're going to have rail step in. With regard to petroleum product pipelines, we have another 62,000 miles of pipelines. Now, depending on your product, you're going to batch it in the same pipeline. And these are whatever you fill in, that's what you offload maybe a week or two further down the pike a thousand miles away. And that's sort of how they work. They originate at these refineries, which are these pink dots here, or pink little squares, and end up at terminals or where they're going to link perhaps with different pipelines or maybe truck or rail or some other mode to get it to market. With regard to hydrocarbon gas liquids, we have another 70,000 miles of pipelines as well. And what we're moving here are what's called Y-grade mix from the natural gas processing plants. And those are the little tan circles there. Um, in addition, we're moving purity products, which include propane, normal butane, ethane, natural gasoline. You probably heard some of these projects, products mentioned. And they're coming from both um, gas processing plants as well as fractionators to the end users. Now, HGL products, what we call the hydrocarbon gas liquids, are moved on highly volatile liquid um, pipelines. This is a term from the Department of Transportation. And what that means is that once these liquids are exposed to the atmosphere, they turn to gas. And one thing I should make a little pitch. Um, we have been changing the way we've been reporting uh, hydrocarbon gas liquids. And yesterday, we had a webinar that explained how we are splitting out the natural gas liquids from refinery olefins. And if it's all available on our website. OK, let's go with waterborne now. So as Kyle had mentioned with regard to natural gas, 
and it's true for almost every product here, except for a crude, we are exporting more than we're importing in this table on the left from 2016 volumes. And most of these liquids and solids are leaving the United States on ships, large tankers, like the ones shown on the right-hand side. So the smaller size tankers, they can go relatively short distance, they're taking petroleum products primarily, and they can hit most any port in the globe. Whereas the ultra-large um, carry, crude carriers can only visit one port in the entire United States, namely the Louisiana offshore oil port. Now ports are sometimes closed like they were with the current hurricanes. And these port closures strain supplies and often result in inventory drawdowns, like the ones you probably heard about in our Today in Energy and This Week in Petroleum articles that are available also on our site. In addition to the, um, the large ships, we have smaller tankers and tug barges and articulated tug barges, barges that are going on coastal as well as navigable inland waterways. So how big is a tugboat? So the tugboat say for the river barge on the bottom right, this one's not showing it, but they're typically pushing about 15 barges. And each barge can carry about 30,000 barrels of petroleum product, just to put that in perspective. Whereas um, you could also move coal, and a 15 barge tow would be about 20, over 22,000 tons of coal. Now, in addition, you have the articulated tug barges on the upper right, and they're moving on our intercoastal waterways, as well as along, say, from the Gulf up to the East Coast. And they're moving anywhere from like 150 to 300,000 barrels. Now, all goods moved between U.S. ports must be moved on U.S. flag vessels, domestically built, owned by U.S. companies, and crewed by mostly U.S. staff or citizens. And that's the Jones Act, which has been in effect since 1920, and is the reason why waterborne transportation is the way it is today. So in, tw in 2016, there were seven, there still are seven large railroads, and they're known as class one railroads, and they've operated almost 70% of the industry's total mileage. And here you're seeing about 140,000 miles of rail that is controlled by these class one railroads. Um, coal and petroleum coke and frac sand, which is used for the extraction of oil and gas, are moved in hoppers like the one, the image on the upper right. Whereas crude oil, petroleum products, ethanol, biodiesel are moved in tank cars as shown in the bottom right image. Now, I like this one. It took us a while to get to this point. But on the left, you can see how coal dwarfs anything else that's any other energy commodities, I should say, that are moved by rail. And we put this all in million short ton equivalents. So on the right, the pink top part of that stack is splayed out in million barrel equivalents. So you can see what the contribution is of the petroleum and biofuels that are there. So EIA um, never surveyed um, rail movements. It's been a sore point for us for many years. And as coal by rail, uh, I'm sorry, coal by rail, as crude by rail started um, evolving in the um, like 2011, 2012, we realized this is a real problem for us because we couldn't show how the crude was getting to the refineries where it was being processed. So we decided to, to fill this void, not by a survey, but by acquiring third party data from the Surface Transportation Board. And we use that data and um, basically uh, estimate from it with various criteria that we've uh, developed. Trucking, it's, it's something we look at, but again, we don't want to double count what's going on in movements um, within the United States, and we tend to show it in terms of large regional movements. But it's highly regulated, and what you'll see during emergencies like we've had recently is waivers are issued to extend the number of hours that a driver can drive a truck without a break or increase the weight of the materials that are carried in the truck. So lastly, I just want, I know I've mentioned many of these, but here are some links to uh, web pages where you can find more information about what we do and how it deals with energy logistics. Thanks.